So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Warman, uh, heading up the small cute company NewZoo. And before you stands a very happy and also a very uh, proud man. And there's two main reasons for that. Um, it's pretty special that a great event like this is taking place only uh, a two minute walk from your office. Very interesting walk, by the way. It's straight through the red light district and you'll hit our office <laughs> if you're up for it. And secondly, I'm also proud to um, today uh, to present what you easily could call the mother of all panels, maybe with all these big names um, on it. And I will be hosting the discussion today, which, will, uh, which is structured um, using about five main questions, a lot of room for improvisation. Um, and it will lead us from the overall relationship between video, eSports, free-to-play, and why it's relevant for anyone in the industry, all the way down to a brainstorm about, you know, what does this mean for indies, and what does it mean for the casual uh, game developers, for instance. But before I let the uh, panelists introduce themselves, um, I just wanted to highlight a memorable uh, keynote of a person that I considered a visionary, uh, Victor Kiesley of Wargaming. <coughs> I think it was a dice or something. Just before that, he bought some uh, data from us, and he used that to uh, quote our 86 billion uh, prediction for 2016. And in his keynote, he said, that's a very boring and very conservative estimate. We should go for 200 billion. And people started laughing, and I thought, oh no, what is he doing? But he, he followed to say, you know, if we maximize the potential that we have as an industry, uh, that should be our ambition. And I think he's actually perfectly right. And um, ultimately, when we are about entertaining people. And he also said, we're about, the biggest reward you can get is people spending time on your game. It's not even money, that will follow, it's time. So we're in the entertainment business and in the times business. And I think that was a beautiful point and it also leads to what we're talking about today uh, because if money follows time, the growth in money, which is a couple percent a year, um, is quadrupled or five times as high in terms of time. In a single year, 50% more time globally is spent on gaming. And if money follows, we're in a perfect position for growth and wealth. And ultimately, it are the companies like we have on stage today, which are facilitating that growth. So I hope everybody can have a couple takeaways from this and contribute to the exciting new growth of our industry. So it's a pleasure to introduce the uh, panelists. And we actually have some pictures up here as well. Don't forget the time. And I wanted to start from, say, in the back towards here. Sean, could you start with 60 seconds of intro? <laughs> 60 seconds, time me right now. Um, so yeah, Sean Charles, um, I work for Total Entertainment. Uh, we produce, amongst others, the Electronic Sports League. And um, I work on the marketing and the relationship with our uh, publishers. Go fast. OK, uh, six seconds left for me. <laughs> so my name is Mohamed Faro. I'm mostly known as Mo, long story short. Um, I'm in charge of eSports for Wargaming for North America and Europe. Uh, maybe some of you know our product so far. It's World of Tanks mainly, the big, big horse right now there for us. Um, we're more or less new as well to eSports. We do it since a year. And uh, we hope to share some very nice insights, some ideas, brainstorms here on this panel today with you guys. Great. My name is Matthew DiPietro. I'm the Vice President of Marketing with Twitch. Uh, we work very closely with most people on this panel here in one way or another. Um, can I get a quick show of hands how many people know Twitch? That's amazing. <laughs> and it's a completely different story than it was a year and a half ago, so that's fantastic. Uh, we're a live video platform built for gamers to share their gameplay uh, live online. And we can get into more detail about that in a little bit. Use this one. Uh, my name is Jelly Jan Bruins. I look after the content partnerships for uh, Nordics and Benelux. Uh, that basically means I work with content owners, rights owners um, who want to grow their reach on YouTube and make some money at the same time. Um, we work with broadcasters, but more and more with multi channel networks uh, like TV Move, Mediacraft, uh, in the Netherlands, social influencers 
who bundle or uh, combine large gaming channels or uh, other beauty channels, and um, uh, and we help them to grow their their reach and uh, to make them some money. Um, well, most of you probably know YouTube. Um, we've been working on a live product for a while, and recently even announced that it's going to be available for everyone. There used to be some thresholds in there, but I think it's uh, up and open for everyone to use now. So uh, let's talk about that later on. Okay, uh, my name is Christoph Seffeling. I am a game analyst, so I don't actually do things, <laughs> which is okay because I'm also a trained economist, which means I can't do anything. Uh, suits me perfectly because I also don't do anything with esports. Uh, <laughs> but I do have a couple of opinions and I have some stories to, to uh, share afterwards. Uh, I work at Ubisoft Bluebyte. Um, Bluebyte is a wholly owned studio of Ubisoft and we have a lot of online games where I follow the data, so to speak, and it will be very interesting to see where the whole esports movement will uh, go and help us in this direction. Cool, that's the, um, that's the intros. We'll have a discussion of, say, about 35 minutes. So we'll have at least 10 minutes uh, at the end for, for Q&A, so uh, save up um, those questions. For a first um, general you know, question, just, just an intro, things like eSports and video and free-to-play are sometimes treated like separate trends that suddenly happen. Um, you know, and free-to-play, that started off in Asia where it was only free-to-play, and out here, and now esports and video is so big. Hmm, but esports was bigger in Asia as well. So is that is there a relationship there? It sort of suggests there is, but maybe we can try to find out how that really how that really works. And Mo, this open question: How are free to play games as a service, video, and esports related? That's an easy one for you. Um. <laughs> a big one. <laughs> easy. So no, in the end, it's uh, just focusing on the on the industry itself. And I started like ten years ago, worked for Blizzard, NC Soft, and other companies. So you could see like uh, a walkthrough through the industry times that you understand that. You're sure of me? Is it really you? <laughs> Good, just making sure um, that everything turns in based on entertainment. In the end, means. Our players who play free-to-play games or normal games or retail box games, whatever, they want to be entertained. And I think Korea is often leading these things as they are a small, strong nation, very high-tech oriented, especially on esports and online games. So it's normal that this would bring more or less the first wind of esports to the West. But recently it changed massively, tremendously through our friendly colleagues of Riot, uh, League of Legends. Uh, awesome game, by the way. They uh, reinvented esports more or less, and I couldn't agree less with them to say it's about the entertainment factor. It's about sure they are pro players or teams fighting against each other, and but the consumer, me, the watcher, can't predict what's happening. So it's something unpredictable happens, and this is the entertainment factor which drove everything around. So this brings pe people together and say, hey. I can play for free. I don't have to invest anything except the most valuable we have, our time. So this is very, very important for any publisher or any developer. I think these days that they have to <coughs> realize time you invest is the one thing that the players will never get back. So our aim, I think, when we cross over with all these uh, different brands is like, better? OK, sorry, is that we bring entertainment the best value for the time they invest. So there's a very good opportunity with esports, with streaming, with uh, just normal content we deliver to make it valuable, make it pay off for the average guy. Yeah. yeah. And but is there from um, do free to play companies have a higher incentive to um, push their esports and, and, and video footage? Uh, Sean. <laughs> well, I mean, looking at the question, you know, free to play, games as a service, video, all those things are, let's say, intricately related with one another. And when you bring a free to play game to the market, you, of course, you need to have that 
longevity, that, because that's how you'll recoup your investment of making that game. So you want your game to remain relevant. So having, um, let's say, a streamer on, you know, uh, on YouTube, on Twitch, talking about your game means it's relevant to the audience that's watching that. If they're talking about, let's say, eSports, that's a very easy weekly amount of information that can constantly give them content to be talking about. The more content that's out there, the more that there is living in that ecosystem, so that'll bring people coming back to the game. So for example, if today I stream and say, I've just played with a new class of tank in World of Tanks, it was amazing, I had the best time, I'm sure, and we have statistics to that effect, that that will spike people using that game. So um, the old term was keep the game in the tray when we were loading games classically just in a PlayStation, Xbox, what, what have you. We want the same thing to happen now, but free to play is that tool. So the barrier to entry is incredibly low, but of course the ability to keep people coming back is very important and you do that by giving them an ecosystem, a world that they'll care about that becomes relevant to them. Before I give it over to the streaming guys, uh, Christoph, you work on the an analytics and you want to get people to get back, so yes, what's your... Yes, so view? we actually do have the statistics and we can see that they will then probably start using that one particular tank also more afterwards. Um, so I wanted to add two things here. Uh, so as you said, the barriers to entry are very low in free-to-play games. Um, that's very good to keep the players coming back and also to keep everyone engaged. It's, I guess it's relatively similar to proper sports. Um, it takes very little money to play sports. Um, you just buy a football and actually only one guy needs to buy a football and then you can play. And if you don't have money for, for a football, you play with a can. Um, and that's the same, I guess, with the free-to-play and the esports movement. They go hand in hand. You can't really play $60, $80 for one title, which is out only for half a year, uh, and expect that to have a big impact on, on the esports movement. Uh, Having a free-to-play game means A, that the players can come in more easily, and B, also means that the, that the game company has an incentive to keep the game running, um, because it's a service now, and it's no longer just the box title that they're selling. Yeah. What have you seen, well, uh, Matt, on Twitch, I guess that's how you, um, that's the wave that you're riding. Uh, yeah, and it's a, it's a big wave. Uh, it's, it's the way I like to think about this, and it's interesting to bring it back down to its sort of fundamental level at, from a gamer's perspective, from a consumer's perspective, which is that video games from their very beginning have always been a spectator experience as well as a gaming experience from the very beginning. My first, personally, my first memories of gaming were playing Pac-Man and, and, uh, and Space Invaders on the Atari with my brother and my sister. And, you know, if I was playing, my brother and my sister were watching and probably hitting me and making fun of me and, and those kinds of things. But it was watching your brother or your friends play the game, even back then, was absolutely central to the video game experience. And I think what we're doing now, um, both, you know, from a VOD perspective on YouTube as well, and live, and live on Twitch, is that we're, we're scratching that sort of fundamental itch that gamers have always had, and we're able to do that in a, at a global scale with, with, with video now. And uh, video, I think, is really, has really become the sort of the social fabric around which gamers are sharing their experiences with each other and their passions for games. Um, you know, gamers like to use Reddit and they will use Facebook and they'll use Twitter and those kinds of things, but I think what we've all discovered is that video is the kind of the native language um, of gamers. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, just last month we had one million unique broadcasters sharing their gameplay and about, about 45 million unique viewers watching that content that those gamers were broadcasting. Uh, so we've, we've really launched ourselves into a, into a new world in which uh, video has, has taken a, a real, you know, sort of central spot in the gaming, gaming universe. And uh, I'm a spectator. I watch my son of 10 play more than I play myself. It's even worse. I watch my son watch Minecraft videos on YouTube more than I gave myself. I'm a spectator, spectator, and that's on YouTube. Uh, it's all consumer-generated um, game footage, isn't it, predominantly? Well, it's, it's becoming more and more 
professional. Well, we can see with uh, um, partners like PewDiePie, who's got over 20 million subscribers worldwide and doing ridiculous amounts of views, is that there's two things happening. One, there's, apart from the games, which are, there's so many fans of them, but there's the games where there's brands coming up as well in terms of personalities, game person or I said it, curators of games who become more and more important. I think PewDiePie is a great example of that. Um, from the publisher's perspective, there's a lot of things happening there, I think. Um, there is getting your game out there, uh, promoting your game, making sure that people see it. Um, then once you've got your game, once you've got your players, whether it's free to play or, or, or you have to pay to play, um, it's really about making sure that everyone engages with the game and is able to share what they, what they do. And through live streaming or through on demand, both are great. Um, life makes it timely, makes it more scarce, which makes it interesting sometimes. On the other hand, on demand is, uh, is what's, what's the majority of viewing uh, still, uh, what we see. Um, so make sure that you build out that community that everybody is able to engage with your game um, and make sure, I think that that's what Mojang's doing really well with Minecraft, is, is in some form curate that as well and, and help the community and steer the community in terms of what, what is possible in, 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 in what kind of content is able, uh, what kind of content you're able to create and, and uh, show off the best examples. Um, and then finally, that's, uh, I think especially for the free to play ones, it's interesting to start making some money with it um, and, and, and build out your, your own channel and, and create your own content with that. Um, and I can be, you can do that on, your, on YouTube or your own platform. There's multiple ways to do it. I think we recently launched uh, video ads in front of gameplays as well. Um, so there's a whole myriad of things, but we'll get to that later, I reckon. Yeah. yeah. That's, um, that's a lot of stuff to take in, and we're actually touching on sort of the second question, you know, where the individual people here um, see their biggest contribution to growth. Um, are there specific uh, events or facts or things that jump to mind which you couldn't imagine be doing a year ago or something that you would like to share with the audience and you think that is contributing to innovation and to um, growth of the whole market? That's a big one. Sean? Yeah, so, I mean, simply put, if we go back a year, two years ago, um, to fill a stadium, you know, a classic sports stadium was just Uncon inconceivable. You, I mean, the idea was there, but the, the potential of, you know, people being able to get there, move their backsides, basically, was, was limited. Um, last year at Katowice in uh, Poland, we filled a stadium with 15,000 people. Um, then there was riot this year with um, the um, LCS championship. I believe they filled the Staples Center. Um, you know, this coming year, that will become more normal. As that happens, that means you know, classically mainstream media will perk up because they're, they're more akin to what's going on there. So eSports in its essence and the free to play movement and this kind of, these massive, massive games really hitting those huge numbers are still, let's say, the, the, the best kept secret. Um, if you don't know about it, you're in the minority, but sadly the minority is most of the time the mainstream media, so it'll spill over. And I think that, that change will really uh, move a lot because it's easy for people to understand oh, there's a sport, it filled a stadium, those two, those two factors connect. So I think that's a big movement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were talking yesterday, I think, you had some cool statements about that. You, you've been a blizzard, you, you've you moved to war gaming and... Yes, uh, to say that, to be very honest, we were surprised, totally caught by surprise in our own uh, roles in war gaming that esports hit us that big and that hard. Um, just to give some numbers, a year ago we had the Go For What, with uh, ESL, and we had roughly uh, 42 teams in Europe. The team in uh, our esports is a bit bigger. We have seven people to 10 people make one team, so it's a bigger uh, group playing together, but 42, we said, okay, it's fine. And then within a year, the community grew so fast and the demand was so big that now we have over five, six, 700 teams participating, and these are like teams of 10 people each playing esports, it means not like just playing our game, they're playing dedicated tournaments out of nowhere. So the community itself drives us, they tell us what they want, they create the demand we, we are not aware of, meaning this is probably a big thing because we're free to play. So everyone can join in and suddenly they dictate, and it's a good thing, don't get me wrong, they dictate what we have to do. That means we have to adapt very fast in development and we make mistakes, it's normal. 
we try, okay, maybe we should do this and this, this spectator mode, this UI, and then we realize this is crap. <laughs> they, people don't want it, they don't want to use it. This is a, they have a totally different demand. We have to look around what, is, what is, drives them. So I can just say it's growing exponentially right now for us as well. Esports itself, in mm -hmm. wargaming, with World of Tanks, and we're just at the beginning to learn. And a and quick, quick anecdote. Yeah. That, that the, um, it's, it's an interesting conversation whenever we're having this conversation with advertisers in particular because the, uh, the, the audience sizes are just absolutely enormous. And it's hard to get people to wrap their heads around just how big those audiences are. They will meet and often exceed you know, uh, broadcast style, cable style television audiences. And it's a hard thing because the statistics are very different. So, you know, a lot of advertisers are used to Nielsen ratings based on television. And you say, you know, the LCS tournament, for example, had many, many millions of viewers over the space of a few days. And that is just absolutely huge. Um, and it's, it's one of the central sort of challenges, I think, for, for a lot of us in the space is getting people to really understand that because the content from an outside perspective for somebody that is not part of that particular community, part of the wargaming community or the riot community, it still looks as if it is very niche when, in fact, it is not at all. In fact, it's very, very, very big. There you go. Yeah, Sean, you want to add to that? I was that? just going to uh, jump in and say I think it's also important in that as we grow, um, there's a certain level of expectation that needs to be set um, on all sides because um, producing content as we do for Riot, for Wargaming, for Blizzard on their, their, um, their chosen games, that didn't come overnight. And you know, we've been working with Riot for five years plus on building up. And as Mo just uh, pointed out, that growth that they're seeing at the moment in the World of, Champ uh, World of Tanks uh, League is something that organically grows. Because day one, a cutie pie doesn't have the interest to start talking about that game because there's no audience for that game. So it becomes a little bit of a chicken and an egg situation. As the audience grows and you start seeing the numbers, then of course the advertisers, the sponsors start to enter in, and of course the publisher starts to see that ultimate return on investment. And when those elements kind of come together in that perfect storm, that's when you see the exponential growth. So it's definitely a commitment too from the, the publisher side and from all, all sides involved. It's funny that you bring up uh, PewDiePie. The, um, everybody is familiar with the, the latest Flappy Bird saga. <laughs> My, my theory my is, clone that this is coming this afternoon. This is that PewDiePie is single-handedly responsible for kicking off that whole thing based on one single video review that he did. He has you know millions and millions and millions of, of YouTube uh, subscribers. Did one did one review and all of a sudden Flappy Bird goes crazy and yeah. the developer lost it. I guess well, it's exactly what you said because th those com those guys are so <laughs> powerful in terms of uh, the reach that they have and the interaction that they have. Um, it's totally different than TV. The traditional TV guys, they broadcast, they throw stuff across the fence, and that's it. But these YouTube um, channels, they interact with the community, they talk back um, uh, when you ask a question, which is, which is for, these, for this young generation, is what they require. Um, and I think PewDiePie is a shining example, but in every country there are probably 10 to 20 uh, PewDiePies. Here in the Netherlands, there's uh, Dus David Games, Dagelijks HD, and a couple of other guys who have got massive followings. Probably the same in Germany, um, uh, in, in the UK. There's, uh, so don't just go out and check a couple of statistic uh, providers like Social Stats or uh, Vidic Stats and find out what the largest gaming channels are in the country and then try and pitch your game there and see if you can get some airtime of these guys. I think that's a very very good investment of your time and maybe a little bit of money if they are really big. But that's probably a good, uh, a good way to start. Yeah, well, m moving towards the game development and the developers that are here in the room and, and um, Christoph's experience. You've got eSports here, but I think there's a continuum between amateur consumer generated video content and professional eSports here. Because in the middle there's people that watch videos of people that are slightly ranked higher. So they're watching it because they want to compete and become better. Is, there a, is it a complete continuum? Does Twitch have a complete continuum of esports content, amateur streams? Is, or is there a big difference between esports and, and the videos on YouTube? There, well, I can speak from Twitch's perspective. Um, you know, Twitch, the, to keep it all into perspective, so uh, one million monthly unique broadcasters. 
out of those million people, we have about 5,000 partners who are uh, revenue sharing business partners of ours. Those are the most prolific, best content producers with the largest audiences. Across that entire spectrum, there is everything from the, the casual gamer who is using video as a way to simply share their gaming experience much like they would use Facebook. On the far other side of the spectrum are folks like ESL and Wargaming and Riot and those kinds of folks who are very large, sophisticated organizations uh, in their own right. So the interesting thing from, from our perspective, I think, is that we've found that every single piece of the video game ecosystem has figured out a way to leverage video in particular for their own ends. And if, for, for the gamer, that's just sharing with their friends. Uh, that, that includes games media as well, like GameSpot and GamesRadar and those kinds of folks. Uh, game publishers, of course, are using their own content sort of as an owned uh, community marketing uh, initiative, all the way over to eSports, which I think is you know, certainly the most well-known uh, example of the way that video is being, being leveraged. And uh, <coughs> Crystal, if you, uh, you manage the, uh, the games and see all the data coming in, what consumers do. If you mix up, you know, the, the, if you allow people to stream video, which in principle is you're allowing consumers to market your product, you're becoming the marketeer. Or how does it work in an organization like Ubisoft? Yes, so to perhaps bring a little bit of the publisher perspective in here, um, this is actually something that we've been seeing in the past, well, I don't know, months or possibly years, that the whole video scene, it can be, can be either be um, the the esports scene or can be the continuum, like you say, from the professional esports scene down to professional let's play or first look videos, down to amateur first look videos, and even to just friends of mine posting a little scene that they played just yesterday or something. Uh, this has a big impact on retention and also on, on acquisition marketing. Uh, uh, so one example that I have on Esports itself uh, is um, e Ubisoft has a game called Mathematic Duel of Champions. It's like a Magic the Gathering card game type, uh, which has a lot of video followers. So there are a lot of players playing this on on video and then streaming it. Uh, and we've also launched a couple of um, couple of tournament style um, leagues, and the winner was then given a trip to the Paris headquarter, uh, and he was shown around the headquarter and everything else, and that had a big response, and it had a big effect um, on players, on the, re on the retention and everything else. So that was, that was a big impact, and yes, this is something that we move more and more into, and we have our marketing teams, we have our PR teams that actually actively look for uh, YouTube channelers with large followers, uh, people with lots of Twitter followers, people who are active in the gaming community and just try and contact these people and show them what kind of games we have because yes, there is a big impact that, that these people have. Yeah. Oh. And there's one thing I would like to point out as I hear it over and over, maybe it's our own fault from the uh, developers, publishers, that esports is like you have these star players, everyone wants to be like them. I, I don't believe in this, like this progress or this way. It's more like, uh, as I said, the very important entertainment factor. I watch these guys, let's say, you know, uh, if it's our game or if it's LOL, they're playing and they do things I could not do, I can't. And this I just look at it, okay, this is something, a skill I feel entertained with. And I think esports is way more than just seeing having two teams, a big uh, a palace to play against each other. This is just like the tip of the iceberg. The real esports, what esports is, at least for me, and the vision for wargaming esports, is it's those average Joe. It's the me yeah. and the you who play with my best friends, with my brother. Just, hey, you see that move that he, they did? And these mm. pro guys, they made, let's do it as well. See if we can compete. And suddenly there must be a system which allows you to progress. It's more, more important than anything else to have a way to progress. And there esports starts. If you have like a ranking system, if you have a letter system, anything, if you have a pal, who wants to reproduce what they saw, just trying to measure your own skill to have like, this is my hobby, I want to see where I am. This is eSports, and this is, the, this is the root of eSports, and it doesn't help us to look just at the stars, because then we focus and lose focus on what's really important. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah just to add yeah. to that, I think there's so much, so many ways and so many different types of content, as everyone here already said, 
is from promotion uh, down to the Joe Average who wants to show off to their friends or wants to discuss their own gameplay with their friends uh, through to the professional stuff either by uh, YouTube partners or by the, the game publishers themselves uh, who, will, who will teach, who will show tutorials, who will uh, do some, some previews or some, pre, uh, some uh, previews of, of, of games. I think one of the key things for you guys to remember is that what we see is there's a large correlation between the amount of views on YouTube and the successfulness of a game. So whether you're free to play or whether you are um, uh, pay to play, it's, it's the amount of views, and to come back to what Matt earlier said, is that video is the new social layers, the new social fabric that connects all these gamers. So make sure that you get your games out and get your videos out uh, way ahead of your launch, and then uh, make sure that you measure and see where these things are being picked up. You can, there's so many analytics, and you know that better than anyone else. You can track everything, and um, if you think one layer further, and how can I give it a little boost, I think that will, uh, will help you in, in grow the, su the success of your games. And it can be a, a stupid game, uh, some of you here said it, uh, like Flappy Bird. Uh, so imagine if you do it properly with a, uh, an even better game that you created. Yeah, well, about, about Flappy Bird, with the principal is an indie uh, development product, I think. Indie was a bit shocked by the uh, mass success. But um, what I found funny is that uh, even on YouTube, there was you know, hundreds or thousands of movies that people made with cheats for Flappy Bird. So it's not only about Minecraft and League of Legends and World of Tanks. People even, you know, they make video footage of Candy Crush, which my wife doesn't know how to do. I don't know how people do it, and then put it on YouTube. Um, so regardless of genre, there is a, a people want to share stuff, and people want to share their game experience. And um, for, for Matt, on, on, on Twitch, uh, you allow indies to, to open up their channel and open up a community. How, how do you, um, what, what do you see happening with, with indies using your platform? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, one of the questions we get a lot is, uh, you know, per, and uh, particularly important for this crowd, is uh, what's next for mobile, what's next for casual in terms of video. Um, and I think that's a wide open question. Um, I don't think, I, I think there's no doubt that it will be uh, every bit as important as PC gaming, free to play gaming. Um, mostly because the, the stories that I think are interesting are things like, like Minecraft, for example. Minecraft, two years ago, I don't think anybody would have dreamed would be the force that it is from in, in the video world. Uh, it's, it's perennially a top five game on Twitch. Um, it's, you know, it's huge on YouTube. A lot of that is because Notch, the, the, the developer, was a very early adopter of leveraging video for his you know, community outreach. Um, and he gathered together a massive audience and people that just started creating lots and lots of videos. Um, you know, another one, I was just talking to the folks. Uh, they've got a big spot on the floor here, a, a company called Everyplay, whose entire business model is based on collecting, you know, capturing video from your mobile game and sharing it to YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. Um, so I think that the, the, you never know what the community is going to do with your game when they get a hold of it. You know, the idea is you want to create a game and turn your game into a platform for creativity for your gamers. Um, and you never know what's going to happen when you open up your, your, your game to video creators, but it can only be good because it's only exposure and it's only product trial and it's only uh, you know, massive audiences getting eyes on your game when with people that are not necessarily your consumers yet. It's just it's the best advertising you can possibly have. Uh, and Sean, you know, ESL and uh, your, your company, Turtle, is known for organizing these uh, huge, cool events and broadcasting them. And, and um, what, 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 what is your relationship with, with Indies? Or what, what um, should they have the Flappy Bird um, Belgian Championships? Or I, is I'd that like something you would happen. facilitate? Or? Just, just so that everybody understands, I'm at 16, which is pathetic. So, <laughs> okay. um, no, so it's easy to look at esports, and what you hear about is, of course, the large, you know, standout, huge events that take place. You know, whether it be at a Gamescom, whether it be wherever in the world. 
It is ultimately, though, a really a grassroots initiative. Uh, the way that esports started out in people's garages, very small, very in the land scene, that's still really true today. It just obviously happens that the same way there'll be kids playing on the streets of Brazil right now, um, and there's somebody playing in the Champions League. Um, the same is true of esports. And for indies, it's just getting in at the right time and understanding how to um, place your game in front of the audience. Um, we have a large four million plus active uh, gamers in the ESL, which is much smaller then than, the, let's say, the hundreds of millions of gamers that will be taking part in World of Tanks. But we know that those players are really dedicated into taking part in esports. So when we unite both a game and that audience, we know we're speaking to people that will pick up and take on from the grassroots. And that could be something very small, a Sunday cup, like a go for cup, maybe only a couple of hundred euros on the line, some in-game credit on the line, but people will take part. The um, time investment is low, but the, the stakes are still bragging rights, honor, glory, ranked wins. Um, that's just as important as the other side of the spectrum, which is the large riot, League of Legends massive event. That's just as important as the small couple of hundred kids playing in a cup. And the, the story between the two is a story of growth throughout. Um, at that small level, there will be somebody who decides to go ahead and stream or cast or make a video on demand uh, over that event. That person could well become the next hero of that, uh, of that scene and become the, the big caster with the big numbers. But of course, they have to start somewhere. Um, Shox, one of our hosts that hosts the, the LCS for, uh, for Europe and uh, also for the uh, World Finals, started out as, a, as a, a journalist going from event to event, just basically interviewing uh, players, what, two, three years ago, and now she's without a doubt one of the biggest hosts in the industry. That's the way it works. So um, for an indie, the, the most important element is start speaking to that audience, start seeing. Some games will touch paper and it's gone, other games won't. We can't predict that, obviously, because the same way I couldn't tell you, you know, will chess be popular at this school tomorrow? There might be a group of kids that start playing it, it becomes popular, and it's, and it's gone from there. Trend is, of course, a, a factor as well, but there is definitely um, not a top-heavy side. It needs to be, um, you know, throughout the entire uh, uh, lifespan of a game, from devs yeah. testing it all the way up to, you know, millions playing it. Yeah. There's many faces of competition, the company GamePoint, which is here, they have this community of ladies and guys playing bingo at age 50, and the ultimate thing they want is moving up the ranks. It's, in the end, it's a sort of competition, it's almost eSports, but in a sort of very friendly, uh, familiar way. Yeah. So obviously, eSports is funded, ultimately, it's, it's almost like being working for UNICEF. You know, we have to get the money from somewhere to put on an event, and events just like this event will cost money, so you'll need sponsors, you'll need advertising, etc., to make that work. Um, the simple correlation is if your game has six people watching it and six people consuming the content on YouTube or on Twitch, there isn't really a very viable business model in the early days to push that through. Now, my job within Turtle is to say, push the business model to side, let's bring that game in and see if we can garnish that by bringing it to a bigger audience because everybody deserves that chance. But ultimately, the game has to be entertaining and work, and if it does, then it'll move from there. But it's definitely so that, um, again, to use that stupid chicken and an egg, it is that way. Twitch makes money by viewers tuning in and then serving advertisements to those users. The same way, you know, if you watch anything in the world, television, the Super Bowl, four million for, what is it, 30 seconds, that's how they're pushing the money right there. We have the same issue that the more people that are watching, the more profitable will be, everybody's happy, everybody wins. If nobody's mm -hmm. watching, it becomes niche. We work yeah. with a lot of games that have very small niche audiences and they still do incredibly well because we see that we're reaching their audience and that's the potential. Other games, the potential is through the roof. World of Tanks is a perfect example of that. Um, bring in World of Warplanes, you know, the sky's the limit to where that game will go and of course we work together to make that happen but at the same time, yeah. it's a little bit like gambling. We don't know but my job is to make sure that everybody gets the chance to, 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 um, to experience that. Uh, uh, yeah. um, sorry, just on that one, we got indie games as well that would like to point out that um, two and a half years ago when I started Wargaming, I had no idea about Wargaming. I'm very honest, there was NC Soft and they came to me and picked, hey, you want to join us? I had, sorry, well, what? Yeah, Wargaming. So it was not a big thing, but um, 
through this change of free to play, our uh, current technology we have, and uh, everyone is using Facebook, everyone is using uh, social medias, that any small scale company, uh, first example is, sorry to say, but Supercell. I met Ilka a few months ago, and we had a chat about it. That all you need is a product which allows to uh, be spectated, to compete. That's all you need these days. You don't have like the big, massive companies who dictate anymore what the market should look like. It's the first time ever that the really the consumer, the audience, drive the market. I know that Mr. Steve Jobs probably would say, yeah, no, 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 but it's really right now happening that the massive audience gets together because my neighbor is suddenly sitting with me next to me in my living room through my mobile phone, through my tablet, through Twitch, YouTube, whatever. So even the smallest scale uh, developer can bring out uh, AAA, MMO, eSport, whatever he wants through the new technology. So this is something we have to be aware of and we can't label eSports right now or the future will look like because every morning I wake up, it's a tip with a totally different approach. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, can I watch my neighbors through Twitch? Is that a sort of get at a takeaway? Well, you don't know my neighbors, but I would love to. But um, <laughs> a, a, a last thing, so, so is, is uh, if you integrate you know, sharing of video and competition in an ideal way from the start, from day one, is that the cheapest, most effective marketing you can do, Jelle? Smartest marketing move you, you will ever make as an indie? Um, well, if I would be uh, responsible for marketing for a, a new game that will come out, I would do a couple of things. One, I would make sure that it would be really, really, really easy to create content by the users and to be able to share that as soon as possible. Um, that's one. Two, I would set up a community manager or a set of community managers that will jump on everything that's happening around the game and react on everything and making sure that you get a community together. And, and the third thing is, and that's where, where Turtle com comes in, is that people need bragging rights. People want to see that they're better than someone else. People want to compete. So definitely, definitely make sure you do that. Um, so it's cre about creating the content, creating the community, and, and make sure everybody can see and share who's best. Yeah. Christoph, one last thing, and then I think we'll open it up for, for, uh, for questions. Do the, um, um, have you seen, have you, have you got to analyze new stuff since all this stuff happened? Ha has your set of analytical skills, has, has that extended into uh, new territories? <laughs> yeah, it's, um Yes, and it was actually something that I had thought of perhaps as a closing statement or something like this, uh, because we talked about this just at the beginning when you show a video of some famous player playing this new tank and then you will see a spike in A users and B also a spike in users playing this, this tank. And we see similar things in our games, of course obviously not with tanks because we don't have a tank game yet. Um, uh, but this is actually something that I personally find very interesting because it does allow us some fancy, fancy statistical tools. So you can do some differences in differences estimators, you can do some IV estimation or everything else. Because the question is, okay, we, we have a Twitch channel, we have a YouTube channel, we have a Let's Play. This pushes a certain amount of players into the game which wouldn't have played either at all or wouldn't have played at this particular time. So we see the Tyke uh, so we see the tank usage spike uh, and then afterwards slowly drop down again. Does it, does it drop down to the normal level be before? So is the gameplay in it sort of stable? Uh, or is it a non-stationary time series? Uh, just to use some fancy words over here. Uh, so, so does this push keep it on a higher level? So are there some path dependencies in here? Uh, uh, so all of these things are testable. Um, and the nice thing about having this on Twitch or live or anything else is that would be my kind of dream come true, is we can steer this. So if I would go to my, my, my Mo counterpart at Ubisoft and tell him, I would really like to test how, how this tank works out. I need you to push in 200,000 users. Uh, and then he would say, oh, of course, that's no problem because we're planning this uh, tournament anyway, so I would just use this particular tank. I think that would be the next step in terms of analytics is, is like opening not an A-B testing sort of thing, but opening the experimental field, so to, so to speak. Sorry. Cool. Well, I actually put the slide on closing statements there because you, you, <laughs> you, you said that, but we're going to open it up to, uh, to the audience first. Um, is there anyone who would like to ask a question to the panel in general or to 
me or to one of the panelists? Oh, good. Thanks, Chris. You saved us. We can also continue talking. We don't need questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You need to repeat partners. that to the microphone. Chris asked what the um, um, what yeah what the incentive is for developers is to work with Twitch and what business models uh, developers can benefit from through Twitch, for instance, or maybe one of the other. Uh, to, to be clear, the, the the business model for Twitch is it, in a very quick, easy way to put it is we have gamers who create content based on games. Those gamers, 5,000 plus of which are partners of ours, and they make money on the advertising that runs on their content and on the subscriptions that they sell on their channels. The, the value for publishers is engaging with those folks because they are the uber influencers in the video game space. They are the most influential consumers you can possibly have. Uh, they create content that, that then gets their community to create content and it creates a, a, just a, a, a big sort of nuclear reaction of content creation all based around this particular gameplay. So it ultimately you're trying cheap. to sell more games. <laughs> so that, it's a community marketing channel essentially is what it becomes. Yeah. So Gamers that are getting a kickback on their subscription fees, isn't it? It's not like indies that get a kickback on the views watched of their game. Am I correct? Correct, yes. The yeah. ultimate value is to drive sales and users for free to play. Yeah. And, yeah it's probably, probably best also just to, to realize that it is actually you know, the modern way of marketing. It's advertising. Um, you know, again, we use the simple example of Cutie Pie. If Cutie Pie talks about your game, you are going into the inbox and into the, you know, the, the, the feed of you know, 20 million gamers people that are interested in that content and it's very targeted it's very you know um, you know there's a high hit rate on it so the value of that is massive when you compare it to what the effort was of getting cutie pie interested um, I think that's important to say for both yeah well this is the, this is the the publishing side again I, I guess um, this is all just advertisement it is a totally new advertisement um, and and marketing channel for the publishers it's takes a while to get used to and it has some special rules and everything else and as usual if you come from big old uh, uh, companies like Ubisoft it, there's some adjustment times that you will need um, but it's but it's a pure marketing channel which has the added value of the content being created which usually were videos and videos ie trailers are incredibly expensive um, you can make them cheaper if you use in-game scenes, but any kind of render trailer will be super expensive. And all of these Twitch and eSports and everything else, that's hours and hours and probably decades worth of videos that don't cost you anything. And the players love them, so it's, it's like a win-win situation for everyone. Does anyone in the audience have a, um, have a question? Yeah, there, with the green hat. Thanks. Um, do you feel that the, the trend of esports gaming is going to trend down, downwards from the core gamers to the casual gamers and towards mobile? And how would someone like Twitch be, put themselves in a position to take advantage of that? Yeah, so the, the question was if it's not loud, if, how it will trickle down to casual games, the uh, Down update. to casual games and mobile gamers, yeah. that, that essentially. Um, the, again, great question. I think it depends heavily on the games themselves. Um, you know, when I, when I was on the flight out here, I ended up sitting next to a, a six-year-old kid and another, like, kind of four-year-old kid, and I was like, oh, God, this is going to be horrible. Um, but they sat on their iPads and they played Minecraft for, like, five hours and didn't say a word, you know. So... If you make, it, you know, you, you just don't know what's going to happen, but I think that mobile gaming in particular is going to get more and more and more sophisticated in its, in its mechanics and, its, and the skill level involved. Um, you know, when, when the next great breakout 
eSports title, if that can be a mobile title, that could open up a whole different world because, you know, as, as everybody here is well aware, everybody is a mobile gamer now, everybody. Um, and the, the, the potential for that, I think, I think is huge. I think the room to, uh, there's room for innovation there and there could be a first mover still in this room that's going to jump on it. So uh, be that person. I think it's also important, the potential is, is obviously there just in terms of users. There's no, no argument there. But of course, the, 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 the difference or the differentiator in there is that something needs to be watchable over and over again. Why does, let's say, League of Legends do so well when the map is essentially the same map and the play type is the same play type? It's because there's a lot of creativity in how you approach problems. It's a very deep game. There's a huge meta game in there. It's similar to chess in terms of, you know, they're thinking in StarCraft, 20, 30 moves ahead of their actual play. Um, and of course, that depth makes it a very interesting spectator sport, the same way that when you look at um, a football matchup, you might say, oh, XYZ players out of the, the d defense lineup, that's going to be important because it's going to open up for their offensive player, yeah. for example. Well, I think um, we're, we're, I would like to wrap it, uh, wrap it up. Um, we have an office full of all kinds of stuff that some of our clients send us, and I just wanted to, because, because these guys came over, because I, sometimes I push them almost to come over, I feel a little bit in debt, and I think this is one of the coolest headsets that I've ever had, so I wanted to do Oh, oh wow. And I want thank to, you very uh, much. Applause from you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, panel. <laughs>